This episode contains references to suicide. Um, if this is something you feel like you can't engage with at the moment, then please do skip. But I do encourage you to come back as it's a really valuable uh, and fascinating conversation. I'd learned a lot of uh, neurotypical ways of interacting. So I knew that when someone says, what's your plans for tomorrow? They don't mean list every single thing that you're going to do tomorrow. Yeah. They mean, I'm asking you to speak about something neutral and say one thing that you might do tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd, I'd learned a lot of neurotypical social cues systematically and mm. um, I could do them, but it's like trying to speak uh, a foreign language for 16 hours a day, but you're never going to be fluent in it. Wow. That's what it's like being wow. autistic and trying to mask. The Imperfect invites you into a very safe place. A place where we share without judgment and drink heaps of vulnerability. Grab yourself a cup. This is the Vulnerability House. And uh, this is a very special vulnerability house because probably I'd say, if not top, top three accents we've had on the podcast <laughs> ever. Wow, thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. It's just the Scottish accent. Who's, what are the other ones? What are, was, yeah, what's been better than this? Well, I don't have any other references, but it's, <laughs> that's why I said potentially top, but I don't, haven't actually run through the list yeah, actively. Yeah. But I'm going to say number one for me. Yeah, it's number probably one Thank you. So yeah. better than English. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Without a doubt. Yes. In this context, with you sitting right here. Yeah. Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> We're joined by Fern Brady, who is a hugely successful Scottish comedian. And I have spent so much time consuming all of Fern's content in the last little while, uh, reading the book, which is just exceptional. We'll talk oh, about Oh, you that. read it? No, I haven't finished it. I oh, am right. reading it currently and I'm cool. raving about it. It's yeah. rare. Oh, thanks. thanks. Um, strong female char- strong female character. Yeah, yes. I wish I'd called it something else. No, but... <laughs> I love it. Because I didn't call it that in earnest. And now people think I've called it that. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. seriously? Uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> but I want, my other title was Here are my thoughts about autism and feminism and things. <laughs> it's, not, <laughs> it's not as uh, marketable. <laughs> I don't mind it. But I, it's rare that I've read a book that has made me laugh out loud that much, oh, cool. but then also just feel such, uh, so, uh, it's such a range of emotion throughout. So congratulations on the book. Thanks. Um, I think uh, I just mentioned before, a very successful Scottish comedian, but I think what fascinates me most and what I have incredible admiration and respect for you for is the journey you've been on um, away from the public eye at age 16 thinking I might be autistic and then being told that you weren't because you have a boyfriend and you make eye contact. Yeah, if you're cute, it's easy to get a boyfriend. Like you can, act, you can really get away with acting quite eccentrically for a long time. Uh, so that's one of the that's one of the most common misconceptions with uh, autistic women, I find, um, and just quite insulting this idea that uh, that autistic people don't date. Um, yeah. But yeah, uh, I'm so glad you read the book. I, I actually wrote a lot of it in Melbourne, you know. I was doing, the last time I was in Melbourne was 2022. Mm. Um, and I didn't go, I mean, I'm not one for going out anyway, but I didn't go out very much because I just sat on the floor of my hotel room writing the book. So it was a really happy memory mm. for me. <laughs> and it wasn't for another 20 years after you were first told you're not autistic that you were yeah. diagnosed 20 years later. Yeah, but I'd had people from my audience Telling me. <laughs> yeah. Oh. <laughs> really? Like at shows? Yeah. In a nice way. Mm. Um, I was doing a show a few years ago and a lot of my show was talking about, oh, I really feel like an alien and I don't seem to fit in with other girls. Um, and then this lovely woman came up at the end and she said, your whole set is a description of an autistic woman and go and read this book called Asper Girls. Um, and then I read it and I went through all the usual things of, why do I need a label? I don't need a diagnosis. And then I went through a phase of thinking, I can probably just, I can probably just fix this, and mm. I think I can learn social cues like a language. Um, mm. And you can kind of learn patterns as to, 
you can sort of learn stuff, but it's never going to be intuitive. And also it's actually incredibly bad for autistic people to do that because that's called masking. Uh, so I was doing a lot of stuff to make people feel more comfortable with me. Mm -hmm. And then when I got diagnosed, I realised how bad that was. Like when we arrived, he was saying, oh, I'm sorry, I shook your hand. And mm. I was like, no, I was so happy that we shook hands because the number of times, even when people know I'm autistic, I have to hug people. Oh, yeah. And for me, like I love hugging friends, long-term friends or my partner. I'm an affectionate person. But for me to hug a stranger that I've never met is so overwhelming mm. and so intimate. Mm. And the way touch, because I process touch differently, sounds so fucking precious. But um, <laughs> and then, this is this is why I didn't want to get diagnosed mm. for years because I don't see myself as a diva. I don't like to make any kind of demands at gigs. Um, but when people touch me lightly, it feels like bugs on my skin for mm -hmm. eight hours. Mm -hmm. And I never was able Gosh. to articulate that until I started getting the correct therapy after diagnosis. And my therapist was like, she was like, I speak to autistic people that have this all the time. And I thought you're just supposed to be okay with it and then go home and feel awful and wiped out. Yeah. It's, I, I think there's a, you know, there's a common thing that people, people who like hugging and they'll kind of insist on the hug because they're a hugger. Yeah. Yeah. You know, if people says, sorry, I'm a hugger, it's like, well, I haven't consented. You've just decided that we're <laughs> hugging because you're, that's your, that's what you like doing. But if you, like, it doesn't bother me, obviously, as much as it bothers an autistic person, but I yeah. can imagine that's just like very, um, you're very confronting. close. You're very close to them when you hug. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> very H close. Hannah Gadsby has uh, good material on it. I think where it's not acceptable for you to say, I'm not a hugger. Mm. Um, mm. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> As a response. Yeah. That's the tricky thing is that the other thing is, is I've got a pretty good idea of what a lot of people think about the increase in diagnoses of autistic people. And I know that people will say things like, oh, she's just using this as an excuse. Or they're oh. using it as an excuse to be difficult. So um, even last week I was doing, I was filming a stand-up set here and then someone on the crew kept just like lightly stroking my arms. A lady, oh. a lot of women do it because oh. it, it's seen as like sort of comforting, comforting yeah. and maternal. Yeah. And to me it feels unbearable. And I was, but I, I, so I said, oh, is it okay if you don't do that? Because I'm autistic and I just tried it out. Mm. Holy fuck, that didn't go down well. Really? <laughs> what do you mean? She, she looked so hurt. Um, but I did, I, I've been told that I'm supposed to start yeah. at least trying a bit Great. to advocate for myself. But even just talking like this, advocating for myself, it sounds Doesn't so... Doesn't feel comfortable. It's so not, it's so like alien to the kind of background that I came from. I mean, it, might, it probably has a lot to do with how the person is receiving it and what sort of education they have. Because I think like... The three of us, uh, you know, we obviously knew that you're autistic, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, but I also have like a very baseline understanding of autism, very yeah. baseline. Um, but if you said that to me, I'll be like, oh, of course, like I understand, like I, f I would feel very, very uncomfortable because I've made you feel very uncomfortable. But if yeah. someone doesn't have the baseline understanding, which hopefully is changing, then maybe they're going to take it personally, like a, like a personal, like you don't yeah. want them touching you. Yeah, you know it's, I mean? it's, it's a tricky thing to get right, but I'm optimistic. At the moment, I think that autism rights and stuff and autism awareness is where maybe gay rights were in the 60s. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. um, I'm always nervous to use this as a comparison, but I see a lot of parallels with it. There's a, there's a growing um, group of uh, autistic people online who are raising awareness of... Uh, issues that affect the autistic community. Amazing. Um, and one reason I love being in Australia actually is you have so many amazing autistic comedians um, and they're open about their autism. Whereas in the UK, it still feels like not many people talk about it as much. Mm -hmm. A bit taboo, yeah. Mm -hmm. mm. Like, yeah. And almost, it's all, uh, something that I've started to get frustrated with is. The perception that getting an autism diagnosis is seen as this left wing, like blue haired <laughs> type <laughs> thing to do. Mm. So yeah, the view that 
that getting a late in life autism diagnosis is some sort of lefty attention seeking thing that grinds my gears. I would love for people to see it with a degree of neutrality mm. rather than seeing autism as a superpower. That's the other thing that's unbelievably patronizing because yeah. that's the other thing that goes about. Mm. Mm -hmm. I'd rather people view it as the difference between an Android phone and an iPhone, which <laughs> that's not. <laughs> I, I, some other aut autism advocate said that, and to me, that makes a lot more sense interesting can so you extrapolate can yeah you explain a bit more like what so the... for example like if you've ever had if you ever had um a macbook but then your phone is android trying to get the two to communicate, communicate with each other? Yeah. is difficult yeah yeah it's possible but yeah. it's not as easy as when you get all apple products yeah. together and there's actually been a study that found uh because a lot of people Autism has been framed as deficit based for so long. So a lot of people talk about, by the way, I'm not making eye contact with you guys the whole time because yeah, that's, that's what, it's easier yeah. for me to yeah, concentrate. Yeah. Of course. So um, a lot of people talk about autistic people don't empathize very much and we don't communicate well. This isn't true. We find it harder to communicate with non-autistic people, but when they put autistic people in groups together, we communicate just fine. Mm, and they've yeah. done studies into this. And um, for ages, actually, I would meet <laughs> the number of times where I've met a guy and been like, oh my God, I have to date this guy. I fancy him so much. And then someone's like, yeah, he's one of yours. And you're like, oh, right, okay. That's why I'm just, clicking, just constantly, constantly drawn back to the to <laughs> autistic guys <laughs> all the time. Or I'll, or like I'll meet um, a new friend and be like, why is it so easy to communicate with this person? And then down the line, they get diagnosed too. So that happens a lot. Um, yeah. But I wish I'd known more about this when I was younger rather than constantly trying to fix myself because I worked mm. really hard to... Uh, not be autistic mm. really, really hard before I got diagnosed. Mm. Like by the time I got diagnosed, I was pretty sure I had it. Mm. Um, so it wasn't like a big moment of realisation. And so you're from a little town in Scotland called Bathgate. Yeah. First off, the singer Lewis Capaldi is from there. Oh. And so is Susan Boyle. Oh. So that really helped put it on the map. Yes. Yeah. And they are so, and Susan's autistic as well. Oh. So I can't watch Susan's Britain's Got Talent interview anymore without feeling upset because um, I don't know if you remember, she, she got big because she did this audition and she's behaving eccentrically in it. She like wiggles her hips suggestively at Simon Cowell. She talks in a voice that to me identifies her as an autistic. Susan's really, really well spoken. Yeah. Um, but where we're from, people have a more regional accent. And when I was younger, I had an accent that was different to everyone in school, which can sometimes be an autistic thing. But Susan's Britain's Got Talent audition to me really exemplifies how cruel non-autistic people can be mm. um, because autistic people get bullied all the time. And it, when you don't know you're autistic, you're so much more vulnerable to it. And that clip of her Britain's Got Talent audition, I would urge people to watch it to see how, mm, how yeah. um, because they're laughing at her and then what she sings well, so she's valid to you. It's so song. interesting you say that because I didn't, I didn't know she was autistic, but yeah. um, my girlfriend and I, we, we watched recently that audition. So Susan Boyle came up in conversation and she was like, wasn't that? audition actually really fucked up yeah like the way because of the way that the producers would have leaned on the eccentricities yeah to lower people's expectations of what mm -hmm. she was capable mm. of but when you actually watch it and think about it not even knowing about the autism but just watching it was like to present someone in the most eccentric different way mm. purely to tell the story is so unfair mm. but i see echoes of that audition and TV programs that I was on before I was diagnosed because there's something this doesn't apply to all autistic people but for myself I feel that I move and speak in a way that is just off enough that non-autistic people pick up on it and I want to back this up with a study to show that this is an insecurity on my part there was a study done where non-autistic people spoke to autistic people and when they, without knowing that they were autistic, they consistently rated them as less intelligent, less attractive, less trustworthy, because the way 
the interpret or mm-hmm. facial movement and tone and everything is so different. So I've seen programs that I've been on or I've watched back things I've been on where there's been people laughing at me mm-hmm. when I've spoke on a program. Mm-hmm. But see, when I was on Taskmaster, I had like the best time on it. And when I watched myself back, it was like the first time I like accepted that I'm that way on camera. Like, Fuck! Yeah. Why did you make me cry? <laughs> so I started to do it there. <laughs> I didn't know. I didn't know. You could have gone. Oh, I could feel away. it yeah. coming up, and oh, then okay. I was like, "This isn't happening." <laughs> yeah, I just pushed uh, years of emotion down. But uh, there's like well-intentioned drives to have autistic people represented on shows, and it doesn't always work out. Like there's this TV show called The Good Doctor that I don't know if you've ever seen a trailer no. of it. It's about a doctor who's autistic. It's played by a non-autistic person, which doesn't sit right with me. And um, he just goes around offending all his colleagues, but they keep him on because he's a damn good surgeon. (laughs) And it's just, watch a trailer of it. It's so, it's so, so offensive. Um, Mm. So there's, there are like these well-intentioned moves to represent autistic people and stuff, but so much more often it happens organically. Although I've got to say, I, I love that show, Love on the Spectrum, but I've seen some interesting debates around it recently that it, it's kind of infantilizing because they'll be like, plinky plunk, and play oh, this yeah. like mm. uh, innocent music and say, Fern hates people touching her lightly and she loves the feel of leaves crunching under her feet. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't know. I don't know what I make about that. That's interesting. Mm. Yeah, I know what you mean. on Mm. balance, I know that the people that make that program have really good intentions and they also are very careful to give people breaks when they're Mm. getting overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. I thought I fucking cried like a baby when I watched that show. Mm. Mm. Yes. Mm. It's so good. Yeah. Yeah. Especially the parents. always cry at the parents parents in it. Incredible, aren't they? Oh, my God. I have so many questions. So... My wife and I, Penny, someone we love dearly, has been diagnosed with autism in the last couple of years. Yeah. And one of the main things I've come to understand or realised is that neurotypical people, and I can only speak for this country, Australia, we have no, there is so little understanding of autism. We just don't know. We really don't know anything about it. And what I hope happens today is that we're able to broaden our understanding and be a little bit more educated through your journey because um, I just think it's, it's so incredible. We have so many people walking around the community who are autistic and the more we all know, the better their life will be. So uh, thank you for being here. First of all, it's so, we're so excited that you're here. Uh, This is the vulnerability house. Mm -hmm. Um, So we do have a, you do have a question to answer or some cards um, to pick up in a second. I just kind of hope that the conversation, it may not, but I hope the conversation comes back to autism because I just, I, there's so much for us to mm. learn from mm. you today. So hopefully one of the cards is, do you have any significant diagnosis as you'd like to talk about <laughs> recently? <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, so if you'd like to maybe pick up the top three cards okay. and read them out and maybe choose one that you would like to answer. Ooh. <laughs> What fear would you like to be free of? Uh, in a film about your life, what challenges would the main character have to overcome? Hmm. How would your ambitions change if you only had one year to live? Right, this one. Hmm. I've got a good answer for this. So which one, which which question oh. was that? Oh. The last one? How would your ambitions oh, change yes. if you only had one year to live? Yeah. So... I'm a bit obsessed with uh, constantly reminding yourself that you're going to die, not in a morbid way. But uh, when I was younger, one of the, uh, some autistic people, there's a stereotype that we're really into Star Trek and love Star Trek or a lot of autistic Mm. people love Doctor Who. I'm obsessed with an old HBO show called Six Feet Under that Mm. must have been Mm. on in 2004. And it's all, it's actually all based on like, Buddhist principles of meditating on it forces you to meditate on your own death because oh, it's a TV really? show set in a funeral home. Every episode, someone dies, and then all the characters are constantly like grappling with the best way to live your life and mm-hmm. thinking about death. So, I've always tried to be quite good about reminding myself that I'm gonna die. And then, around when did I get, when did I get my book deal? Maybe 2021, 
right, I wasn't feeling very well. I was feeling really tired a lot. And then I, my hands were tingling and I, I was really, really unusually exhausted. And I thought, well, this is a bit strange. Went to the doctor. The doctor sent me for a brain scan because they were like, oh, your age, we're gonna, we want to rule out MS. And then he phoned me the night of the scan and was like, we found a little growth in your brain. So I like oh. didn't even listen to the rest of the, what the guy was saying. I was like, oh, howling, crying, went through to my boyfriend. Mm. I'm against marriage. And I was like, do you want to get married? <laughs> <laughs> Immediately. First thing. <laughs> yeah. I was like, we should, ha- we should marry, we should marry on my deathbed. Um, <laughs> and, Such an experience. <laughs> yeah. So the, the doctor was like, you got to come back in the morning because um, we think this could be a brain tumor. And he said, I'm so sorry to phone you about this oh late at gosh. night. So I like laid awake on it. This is always how I do an impression of me sleeping, like I'm in my coffin. Oh yeah, <laughs> arms crossed over your chest. And I like <laughs> laid awake and I thought of all my like any regrets that I have. Um and I'd I'd been thinking how I was gonna approach writing my book, and then I just immediately thought, okay, well if I'm gonna die because I might have a brain tumor, I'm gonna write the book in a way because I'll be gone anyway, so I'm just going to write it without any embarrassment. Wow. And that was what led me to put, I put the, the by far the most shameful aspect of my autism in it. I dread other late diagnosed autism books and enjoyed them, but I felt people were holding back mm-hmm. or I felt like people weren't talking about some of the more taboo aspects of it. Um, so I just had this night of being like, okay, I know how I'm going to do the book. Went wow. to the doctor in the morning. This dramatic bitch of a doctor <laughs> is like, <laughs> he's like, oh, we think you've got a pituitary cyst and it's not a tumour. But I just phoned you last night to say that because <laughs> we thought it might be. And then it tur- I do have this little, it's just like this little lump that I get monitored every few years. But all, the only reason my hands were tingling was I had a vitamin D deficiency. I don't know if it's showing up on screen how white I am. Uh, and I've been wearing like Factor 50 sunscreen since I was 18 <laughs> in British weather. <laughs> so that was all it was. So I have had, but I felt lucky. It sounds so stupid. Mm. I felt lucky because I had one night of get, yeah. having that feeling without having to actually. I feel <laughs> like we die. should all, it sounds awful, but I feel like we should all have that to well, bring out things that we need to. Or go to that yeah. doctor. Or yeah, go, feel, go to that like dramatic the, bitch of a doctor. Did yeah. your publisher like ask the doctor to make that call just to improve the book? Oh, maybe. <laughs> mm. Oh, maybe she did. Yeah, that would be just like her. <laughs> Classic <laughs> publisher move. Yeah, yeah. Mm. No, um, so, so then I just kept hold of that feeling all through writing the book because we are going to die anyway. Um, it doesn't, just like, it might be ages away, but uh, within the span of history, we're going to die reasonably soon. Yes. Mm. Um, oh. So you should just say what you want to say now. Yeah, oh, I love it. It's so true. Um, it's a real, it's a real, like, of course, like, I'm sorry that you had to go through that for that night, but it's a real gift for, yeah. creatively. Like, it's yeah. a real, like, um, yeah, to be able to write without fear is pretty amazing. Well, I've tried to walk other people through thinking that way. Like, my dad is always complaining about his job. Uh, and I'm like, well, you know, you'll be retired soon you'll, and then you'll be dead. So you should think what you want to do. Mm. But a lot of people don't really like you saying you're going to be dead soon. Um, mm-hmm. They mm. seem to take it differently. It's quite <laughs> confronting, yeah. Well, for me, it's a, it's um, you should think that way because that is how it's going to be. Well, it's um, funny actually because I, I I don't really like thinking about it, but it's it's so interesting and probably speaks a lot to what my priorities are. But when you frame it in terms of like it helped you with your work, I go like, oh, that is that is, I can see how that would really <laughs> be helpful. Alluring. Like writing from a truly truthful place and having no fear of what people will say or how you'll be humiliated or embarrassed is so liberating. Yeah, I mean, the downside was the book came out and then way more people read it than I thought. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so so what are the things that you wrote about in the book that you may not have written about? Meltdowns. The meltdowns. Yeah, okay. that, I mean, it's so embarrassing. Uh, and that was the one, that was the 
number one thing that pushed me to get diagnosed because that was the one thing I couldn't seem to fix because I'd learned I'd learned a lot of uh, neurotypical ways of interacting so I knew that when someone says what's your plans for tomorrow they don't mean list every single thing that you're going to do tomorrow yeah. they mean I'm asking you to speak about something neutral and say one thing that you might do tomorrow <laughs> <laughs> so that's <laughs> I'd learned a lot of neurotypical social cues systematically and mm. um, I could kind of, uh, I could do them. But the best description I've heard of trying to keep this up is it's like trying to speak uh, a foreign language for 16 hours a day, but you're never going to be fluent in it. Wow. That's what it's like being wow. autistic and trying to mask. Um, it must be exhausting. Well, yeah, so I didn't understand the connection so I would do all that during the day and then I remember I would be on tv sets and I would feel really um like tight and tense in my body um and the lights on a tv set are often f they're fluorescent like this mm. is my dream lighting setup you've got some natural white mm. here you've got a wee soft light in the corner it's um, oh, that's very that nice to hear. Nice to we hear. would usually have this really bl really bright, and we've we've toned it down. Yeah, yeah. That's so touching. Well, it wasn't my idea, but I'll take the praise. <laughs> oh, oh my god! I can't believe you did that. That's so cool. We've we've tried to make this like the Fern Brady like dream spot. Yeah. Oh. I was like, they'll try and make me cry on this podcast and it won't work, but that's genuinely touched me. Uh, <laughs> we, won't, we won't try and make you cry, bro. Oh, I thought it was one of those. Uh, <laughs> Look, if you want to, we'll take yeah, it. Yeah, we'll definitely take no, it. Oh, yeah. that's really nice. But yeah, so I would, I, would, I would be on sets or I would be doing jobs and I would feel really physically uncomfortable and feel like I was trying to hold things in. And uh, then I would get home and just... Even if I was in the house on my own, I'd end up like punching a wall and I'd think, well, that's weird because I don't feel angry. I mm. just feel pressured. And a lot of people describe it having a meltdown. It's like shaking a bottle of fizzy Coke and then you open it when you mm. get home. Oh, yeah. um, and it was when I got diagnosed, I actually found out off my mum that when I first went to school, at parents' night, the teachers would be like, oh, Fern's so quiet. She's so well-behaved. She just sits and stares out the window. Mm. She doesn't seem to be tuned into what's going on in class, but she's so quiet. And my parents were like, this cannot be the same child mm, yeah. because I was coming home and just, like, roaring, screaming, like, having these violent tantrums. And, I mean, that pattern then went on until I was an adult. And this is so common of autistic girls especially um they learn how to cover it up in school because mm -hmm. it's not acceptable to kick off in school do, do you mind um i'd be interested to know what the meltdowns looked like like what what they would how they would present they look like you're angry they sometimes oh, so embarrassing you like it's like you get stuck in a loop and you say the same thing over and over again and before I even got diagnosed, my boyfriend, I've been going out with the same guy for like 12 years. Just Connor? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, he'd said to me, uh, no, I'd said to him, oh, I, I think I've got Asperger's, which is what they, they used to call it. And now it's just like ESD1 or whatever. Uh, and then he went and read up on it. And then the next time I was having a meltdown, he came and like gave me a tight hug because he'd been reading up on things to do when oh, like wow. your autistic kid has a meltdown and he was using the tactics on me because mm. he was at his wit's end, like mm. what is going on? And I'd had other partners before that I think must have picked up on it a bit. Like I remember going out with someone that was like, you love to tell the same story over and over again and you tell it in the same format every time. Oh. Obviously that was like great because I As then went stand into stand-up. Yeah, yeah. yeah that, was before, that was before I went into stand-up. Otherwise, <laughs> yeah. I'd be like, yes, you were just at one of my tour <laughs> shows. <laughs> I mean, it's a very oh funny God. story, yeah. but you keep saying it every night. Yeah, <laughs> every yeah. Night. Or like, I'd, uh, um, yeah, this guy I went out with at uni, I remember just kicking off because we were meant to go out somewhere for my birthday and I was very like, 
at this time we will go here mm. and then at this time we will go to this bar and then that didn't happen and he was like why do you care let's just like we're just out with our friends because I didn't know that I had this attachment to routine and certainty and knowing when everything's going to happen mm. um, and I used to think that I had a really hard time going on holiday with Connor my boyfriend and then he was like I'm just going to try something for our next holiday, I want you to decide what we're going to do and then we'll have a day where we go off and do our own things. Um, and then we started doing it more that way and then it was amazing. Mm. <laughs> Whereas before, I just... Holidays were so stressful to me because my routine was totally disrupted. Um, and I just sort of thought, well, I guess I'm just a bitch because uh, my family has always been like Fern's a nightmare on holidays and she kicks off but it's because the whole idea of mo most people love a holiday because of the disruption mm. to your routine mm. um, and so you tour a lot you do a lot of yeah. touring now do you want to know how I manage on tour yeah. yeah yes okay so like every time I come back to Melbourne it gets better and better because things are the same uh. so like I was in the same hotel for three years I go to the same place for breakfast most days. Um, whereas I used to feel embarrassed about that. I would go to the same mm. place for breakfast and have the same order mm. to the extent that like the waiters would pick up on it and yeah. kind of thought it was kind of funny. And then mm. I'd start going to a different coffee shop and try and rotate coffee shops to be more normal. Mm. And that's a, it'd be such a sense of comfort. In a, yeah, it's in amazing. A, yeah. Mm. I had such a hard time the first year I came to Australia I couldn't work out why, because I was with such a nice group of comics, but everyone loved going out and socialising all the time in really noisy bars. So I kept forcing myself to go out to them because I am a sociable person. I like socialising, but I've realised since then I kind of need to socialise in my own way. So it's something as simple as just two or three people at a time mm -hmm. and going to a cafe that isn't noisy. Yeah. It's just little things like that. Uh, whereas the first year I came here, I was really pushing myself to do a lot of social stuff that I found hard. And I kept looking around and thinking, well, no one else is finding this hard. And mm. people were like, oh, Fern's complaining all the time. And I just felt bad. Whereas now I know how to go about it. Yeah. Can, can I ask you about the role of choice in all this? Like, if, Yeah. Because I was curious to know if choice is an empowering thing or a daunting thing. For me, I think it's better if someone's given you a choice, it's best if they say you can do this or this rather than an open-ended thing. What do thing. you want? Sort Remember of thing, the yeah. thing with the headphones at the start? Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> that would have gone on forever. <laughs> yeah. Well, we gave you the option to well, wear headphones or not. Yeah, well, yeah. and then I was like, what do you want me yeah. to do? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what is going to be the more normal thing to do? So, mm. yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm still learning about it all the time. It's crazy how much new stuff I learn about autism all the time. And you were, I, I thought it was really interesting how you're talking about the, your concerns about a label, about getting a label and what yeah. that might be. How is that, how did that play out for you once you did get, as you said, the label? So one way I protect myself from... I basically have a very low expectation slash no expectations of non-autistic people knowing anything about autism at all. Yeah. Um, so I know other people who have been diagnosed since, like, a, a lot for a lot longer than me, and they're much better at advocating for themselves. Whereas, for example, if I'm getting my hair and makeup done on a TV set, I would be uncomfortable telling them, when you powder my face a lot or when you cover me in hairspray, that feels really unbearable. Mm. So instead, you just have to tell white lies. And I hate lying to people. Mm. But my the doctor that diagnosed me said, just say to people, oh, hairspray gives me a headache or I'm mm. allergic to this face powder and frame it in ways that people understand. But I, can't, I do think... It shouldn't be that way. I would mm. love it if it wasn't that way. But it's tricky to... I understand why it's important to advocate for yourself, but at the same time, I'm really ambitious in terms of what I want to do in comedy. 
And the number one thing in comedy when you're on a TV set is never be seen as a diva. Mm -hmm. And to me, asking for things like that seems precious. It strikes me as a lot of pressure to put on someone who's trying to navigate the world themselves to then also have to advocate for... Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. For a world that isn't set up for the way your brain operates. Like it's a, it feels yeah. like there's two levels of pressure going on there. But if you think like if I'm meeting so many different people in a day, trying to explain to, um, I don't know, the tech in a regional arts centre, can we not have the lights really bright on stage? <laughs> because I'll just yeah. say something like I have a sore head because mm. I'm not going to be like, oh, I have sensory issues with light yeah. because I just... It's just the kind of background that I come from. I mm. just know the way it's going to be received. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's frustrating. God, yeah, but, I can imagine. Yeah. Particularly going to all yeah. these different venues and dealing. You now we've done, we did a live show for the podcast and yeah, you're going to all these different venues. Yeah. And every time you go to a new venue, it's like a new tech and it's a new yeah. venue manager or whatever. And some of, you know, most of them are really, really great, but. Of course, there are people who've been working there for forty years, and this is the way you do it. And if you request anything different, they'll be they'll look at you like you're really uh, inconveniencing them. Yeah, no, I mean I've I've got lovely texts, um, but and it also at the same time, comedy is a million times better than when I was working in an office. That was really I felt like I was having to keep myself contained all day. Yeah. Okay. Um, because you're constantly monitoring your posture, uh, your tone of voice, your facial expression, um, even the way you eat. If you eat in a strange way, that'll get picked up on in an office. Mm. Uh, so, yeah, comedy is so much better. And there's a high tolerance for eccentricity in comedy mm-hmm. uh, as well. That's a good thing. Can we, can, we, can we just go back to Ryan's question before, which was oh, around, yeah. just around the meltdowns? Because in your book you describe them as you were saying – you're always yeah. just smashing stuff up. Even in, just in your... talking about them here is embarrassing. Well, well, we don't have to. I just no, I, it's, it's I, just such a big part of the, your experience. The reason I felt like I had to was because I couldn't find any information. Uh, I was going on websites like the National Autistic Society in the UK. I was going on their website and I was constantly having to refer to guides for parents of autistic children, mm. even though all autistic children grow up to become autistic adults and they continue to have meltdowns but it's so secretive so I was only able to find information about meltdowns from uh, like I say a lot of these new autism advocates that are popping up and setting up podcasts talking about autism in detail because there's not very much professional support I mean when you get your diagnosis and this is why I've got a bit of an issue with there's there's a I don't know if it's like this here, but a lot of people talk about autism and ADHD in the same breath and there are overlaps, like a lot of autistic people have that and ADHD. But when you get diagnosed with ADHD, you get a prescription, right? When you get diagnosed with autism, you get a reading list and you're they're like, good oh. luck at parties, see you later, <laughs> <laughs> send you off. Um, there's, there's not any support, so I got diagnosed and I was still having meltdowns mm. and I had to develop because autistic people are good at creating systems for stuff. Um, that's what, And so many autistic people thrive in Silicon Valley and all mm. those workspaces are set up actually to be more autism friendly. Mm. Anyway, um, I started tracking my meltdowns for a year after I got diagnosed to try and find out the triggers um, and I managed to reduce them that way. So I found things like having a bad night's sleep, um, things like drinking alcohol really affects me. Um, Like a lot of autistic people react really strongly to drugs and alcohol or even medications. Mm -hmm. Um, So, so many autistic people get misdiagnosed for years with all these mental illnesses And they probably do have depression and anxiety from being undiagnosed, Mm. but they get put on these medications that are too strong for them Mm. or that they shouldn't be on at all. Mm -hmm. Like I was on Prozac from when I was 16 till I was 21 Mm. and it made me more comfortable for other people. It made me very bovine. 
and very kind of sedate, mm -hmm. but it didn't help me. Mm -hmm. um, and I've never been on medication since then. And I'm, I, I, I don't, I don't want to get in bother. It's up to other autistic people whether they want to take meds. Some autistic people feel like they have to. Mm -hmm. But for me, getting a sensory diet made for myself was so much better. And I've got a friend who has autistic kids, a friend in comedy, and he'd said for years before I got diagnosed, when I thought I probably had it, he said, you need to go to an occupational therapist and get a thing called a sensory diet made. And that's where they work out your sensory needs. So, mm -hmm. for example, I have problems with light and touch and sound. Mm -hmm. So I do things like when I'm on public transport, I wear noise cancelling headphones. Mm -hmm. Or I try and do quite a lot of exercise because... Um, that it just gets a lot of the it just really helps me to move mm. about a mm -hmm. lot mm. it gets a lot of nervous energy out yeah um but yeah i mean i only just got the sensory diet made for me recently ah, right. and i got diagnosed in tw 2021 2020 because yeah. like as uh as far as being a comedian i'm not a comedian stand-up comedian but it's uh you got i I've, I've been to a lot of gigs like particularly where there's mm -hmm. like a lot of people on the bill and often, you know, between the, the acts, like the MC might kind of like introduce, you know, Fern Brady and then music blasts <laughs> and lights go crazy. Mm. It's almost like the worst, like that, might, was that challenging being in those sorts of environments? People ask me a lot about the lights and sound at gigs, but honestly, I was thinking about this the other day. Maybe because I know that that's going to happen every night, that's fine. Um... I went to watch a comedian the other night because I so rarely get to go and watch comedy. And when I was in the audience, I remembered I find it so much easier to do the gig than to sit in a gig <laughs> and put up with like people rustling crisp packets, talking on their phones. Like I get so distracted. Mm -hmm. If someone touches the back of my chair, my brain interprets it as a threat. Mm -hmm. If someone just had long legs, and their knees kept bumping the back of my chair. That's so much more stressful. Or like the plane rides between the gigs, people touching the back of your plane mm. seat. Yep. All of that is worse than the bit before you go on stage. Yeah, yep. interesting. Um, because yeah, yeah, because the you don't know what's coming. It's like a surprise. It's unpredictable. Yeah, and, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, the 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 bit where I do my job and say the same thing every night and try and work out a system for it. That's the best bit. Oh, of course. The system of getting the jokes right and getting yeah. the order right. Oh, that's fascinating. Because autistic people, we go around all day thinking, how could I have made that social situation better? And what could I have said differently? And then stand up as a process of refining the perfect thing to say to someone again and again yeah. and again. <laughs> And it's just very, very satisfying. Mm. One of the things I'd love to chat to you about is mm. friendship. Oh, yeah, yeah, Because yeah. I feel like what I've learned in the last couple of years is that certainly what I have observed, and it might not be the case for you, this could be just very specific to, to this example, but it's like the disability to me seems to be an inability to know what friendships are, to really want friendships, but to find them so unbelievably hard to to have i guess or, or to make friends or maintain friendships is that yeah i talked about that in the book although when i was writing the book i was going through a phase where my boyfriend pointed out that i'd started viewing friendships like uh like the friends tv series and i developed a very idealistic form of friendship <laughs> where's my joey yeah <laughs> yeah um but friendships something i've been thinking about and talking about a lot because a lot of people expect their romantic partner, especially men are quite bad for this. Uh, they, they get a wife and then they forget to have male friendships, don't they? Obviously mm. not you guys, because mm. yeah. you're all pals doing a podcast. I presume you're friends, or do you not know each other? Oh, uh, yeah, well, these two are brothers. <laughs> we're brothers, yeah. yeah. We're brothers. yeah. Whoa, what? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you kept that quiet. <laughs> no, we did, didn't we? <laughs> right. It's, it's usually the big yeah. reveal at the end. <laughs> <laughs> Big family wow. photo. Um, oh, yeah. cool. No, we all, yeah, I would say close. we love each other dearly. Yeah. Would be my, oh, would be my. that's lovely. Very much But so. yeah, so a lot of um, men end up letting their wives organise their social lives and then their partner becomes everything to them. Um, and I'd say I tend to be that way in relationships too and I have to remember to, like, don't 
don't expect to get all your emotional needs from your partner. You, but with female friendships, sometimes my boyfriend's heard the way me and my friends voice message each other on WhatsApp and he's like, you guys talk about everything. It's mad how you just mm. talk about stuff so emotionally. Whereas he, he had his best friend have a breakup and I was like, oh, why did they break up? And he said, I don't know, I'm going to ask him when we go on our walking holiday. And I was like, okay, if you were a woman, the way it would work is you would talk <laughs> about it immediately and then the walking holiday will be used to repeat the main point <laughs> of why the ex is a bastard, why the best friend always knew that he wasn't good for you. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Oh, Whereas, I have that issue all the time where I yeah. like jam my partner, she'll say, if, if a friend of ours has just had a child or something, had like the new, new parents, I'll get home from hanging out with this guy for the, a whole day and Jam will be like, how's how's the baby going? And I'll be like, oh, we didn't really talk about it, actually. <laughs> yeah. 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 One, of, one of my absolute best friends lives in New York and when he comes out here and we have like a couple of days together, I don't think we actually discuss anything. Mm. Like it's just I, I, I couldn't tell you what he's done at work recently yeah. or like It's just other screaming things. Footy between drinking beers. <laughs> yeah. You read me like a book. Yeah. No, um, yeah, I don't know. It just doesn't happen. Even though I'm quite a vulnerable, deep talker, like I love this stuff, but it just doesn't seem to happen with a lot of my male mm. friends. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's weird. I often find as well a lot of, because I have a lot of male friends um, from just from doing comedy because there's so many guys and they do tend to, they keep emotional chats to their female friends or their partners and then... Uh, between men, it's just I don't, I don't know what you talk about. Yeah, I don't know what you talk about. I can't about. remember external what we talked things. about either. <laughs> yeah, external stuff. Or what's happening right now? It seems like yeah. what's <laughs> happening in the moment. What we're, we're, we're doing. <laughs> it's like don't stray wow. from whatever the activity is. <laughs> but yeah, about friendships in relation to autism, I sometimes uh, forget to socialize, and I have to remind myself, almost like a hygiene measure, like brushing your teeth. I think, oh, you haven't spoken to anyone in a couple of weeks because mm. I get so um, focused on work. I get such tunnel vision with it. Like one of my friends said recently, because he was like, oh, do you want to meet up? Shall we go for a walk in the park? And I said, I can't. I've got a new show tonight and I'm going to Australia. And he was like, that's in three months' time. Like <laughs> you're not busy until then. <laughs> yeah. But for some reason, the way my brain thinks about it is, well, I just have to work solidly mm. and then I can see my friends in June. And that's been something I've had to get out of. Do you mind me asking about friendships uh, as a child when you didn't know? Yeah, that a... was a lot harder. <laughs> yeah. What was it like? Well, like when I was at nursery. Sorry, what, what's nursery? What age is that? What are we talking? I think you guys call it preschool. Mm -hmm. like kinder, yeah, yeah. Four, so like, yes, when I was okay. four. Yeah. Okay. I, I remember getting dropped off at nursery and I just, it was like I was struck dumb. I could not speak to people Mm. couldn't get words out at all so I would have to just go to nursery I couldn't even ask to go to the toilet so I would just piss myself because I would just like look at people and think I don't know how I'm meant to speak to anyone yeah. um, and I would look at people playing and sort of think how, I don't know how to join in here um, and then when I went to primary school I would just go and chat to this tree in the playground um, and my mum showed me a drawing that I did where we were meant to like do a drawing of our first day at school and it's just me standing next to a tree with like my back to the viewer. It's so, it's <laughs> oh, so gosh. Wow. Wow. Um, and the only way I made friends at primary school would be like little kids forcing their friendship on me. So mm. a little kid would come over and be like, be my friend now. And then once someone tried to be friends with me, I would just like clamp onto them. Oh, okay. Um, and actually a lot of uh, little autistic girls end up becoming friends with the most popular girl in class and then that girl ends up um, being a shield for them mm. and they can just, they get, but they are um, where what they lack in like understanding a social situations, the best friend makes up for it. And my best friend at high school actually was I'm sure in, in the yearbook she was like one of the most popular girls in the year. Gosh. Did and when we bumped into the head girl, I don't know if you people have head girls mm. here mm. in school. You people. Fucking head girl. 
Um, <laughs> you scum. It works. <laughs> no, I, don't, I don't know why, where that came from. So <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't sleep very well last night. No, I totally know what you meant. Yeah, so, yeah, um, yeah. so years after I left school, me and my best mate from school, we bumped into someone from school who said to my friend, oh, Lauren, I bet you're a comedian now. And she said, no, fairness, actually. And this girl just looked so shocked because mm. I just did not, I really, like, didn't speak mm. that much at school or I was seen as just a weirdo. So your memory of school, is it was extremely difficult? It was so, academically it was fine, but, I mean, I would happily have just, I think if I could have been homeschooled, but then I would have had to see my parents even more. Uh, I wasn't keen on them. But if if there could have been a way of me doing my school work on my own, I would have loved that because mm. the environment of school was so, so stressful. Both primary and secondary school, um, I had teachers ask why I was in, hiding in the toilet cubicles and eating my lunch in the toilet cubicles. This is another thing that when I wrote the book, I thought it was so specific to me and I've since found out that loads of autistic people do this mm. because the fluorescent lighting of school, the noise, like the all, all the social demands when you move from primary to high school are so difficult um, mm. that it's just very overwhelming. That transition must be so hard. Primary school to, to secondary school must be so difficult. Yeah, and tons of uh, girls especially, uh, when they transition from primary to secondary school, autistic girls, that's when they have a lot of trouble. Um, and there's this well-worn path of undiagnosed autistic girls. It doesn't have to be this way where they're like kind of cool and quirky in primary school. And like when I was at primary, I was, would be really bossy and I would make up games and... I would give little talks behind the bins to girls and being weird was seen as a cool thing. Mm. And then when you turn into a teenager, that's like the last thing you want to be. Everyone looks at what everyone else is doing and falls in line. Whereas I kept being weird and I kept dressing really strangely and that wasn't seen as a good thing. And then I ended up in a CAMS unit when I was 16, which what, is what like, do, um, it's do? a child psychiatric unit. And you go to school there instead of okay. going to school. Uh, so I was in there for a couple of months. And I believe that I was in there with other un undiagnosed autistic girls. Yeah. Okay. But we were treated, we were always treated as if we'd done something wrong. You described your secondary school as a bin fire. It was, a it was like being in a, <laughs> it was like being in a prison, honestly. It was so rough. There would be like people, I remember one time a boy sprayed deodorant in his mouth at the back of the classroom and then like set fire oh to it and was God. like Whoa. and then the teacher was just like <laughs> a literal bin fire yeah the teacher was like pipe down at the back or I've got this really vivid <laughs> Whoa. like a lot of the teachers as well you just think if I met those people in a pub I would not talk to them they were like a lot of them had definitely had breakdowns and it wasn't being addressed so many of them were so such strange people um and also I went to a Catholic school in Scotland. Now, I don't know if Catholic schools in Australia have some degree of prestige associated with them, but Catholic schools in Scotland are from when, I believe they're from when Irish immigration happened, right? So my great-grandparents were Irish and the Irish were seen as these, like, poor immigrants. They all kept themselves to themselves and we got given separate schools. And for ages there was a real lack of social mobility amongst Irish Catholics in Scotland. Um, so the priority in my school was maintaining Catholicism and teaching religion. There was no focus on education. Mm -hmm. They would be so annoyed if I said that, but wow. there really wasn't. Yeah. Um, mm. uh, it was all just about let's maintain this division between Catholics and Protestants because that's quite a big thing where I'm from. Oh, yeah. Like everything was... Catholics are this, Protestants are that. Yeah. Um, because my family came over from uh, Ireland, my great-grandparents, and then they, it was like they just perfectly preserved this old-fashioned Irish culture where you go to church all the time. It's like a non-negotiable. Sex is a massive taboo. Um, you're constantly told things like Protestants are evil, um, Random things, like my dad told me Catholics 
don't have nice gardens because we're busy going to church. It's just, it's like so hard to explain. <laughs> But it's just this all-encompassing thing. You get, you would get taught to recognise Protestants by their names. Mm. So all the Protestants are called like Douglas Fraser. All the Catholics are called Ryan, um, yeah. Kelly. Like everyone has mm. certain names, and it just is this huge thing. Gosh, um, when you you were talking then about the CAMS unit and that, yeah, uh, yeah. that you were there, with a lot of girls had just basically been told they're bad. Is that how it was fra- is we, that how No, it we weren't it- told we were bad. We were all in there because we'd been unable to keep going to school. A mm. lot of us had attempted suicide. I think that was what got me in there. I'd stopped. I stopped going to school. Uh, not in a... And I remember it being... I couldn't really work out why I'd stopped going to school because I was very a goody two-shoes mm. and I was very into my school work and I wanted to get straight A's. But I remember just sitting in class one day thinking, this is too much like I have to leave and also at lunchtime I wasn't seeing my friends anymore I would just sit in the library on my own um so I stopped going to school and then I took an overdose and then that was their cue to be like we're gonna put you in the unit so as far as I know that was what other girls were doing a lot of them were self-harming but the way we were treated by the staff now as an adult I did some support work with um in like a hostel for people that had come out of prison but a lot of them had mental health problems yeah and i saw the same thing in the staff i think it's just the nature of the power dynamic Mm. um just the way the staff were with us it wasn't therapeutic and it wasn't effective and and i wish my autism had been picked up in the unit because i was doing a lot of things that were telltale autistic things so i addressed the staff as if they were my peers because autistic people don't recognise hierarchy. Yeah. Um. You have to earn. You have to earn uh, respect mm. for yeah. like, do I don't know doing good stuff and yeah. stuff mm. like that. Mm. Um. I would ask questions that were seen as really dodgy because I didn't know what were the right questions to ask. Yeah. So a lot of autistic people are just trying to find out facts and clarify stuff and create certainty, and very often this is seen as nitpicking, being difficult being like intrusive in a creepy way so there was one time I got in massive trouble in the unit and bear in mind all I wanted to do in this unit was study for my exams and get into uni I just wanted to get straight A's and get into uni um and there was this nurse this male nurse in the unit and I said oh have you have you had twins recently because I saw there were two car seats in the back of his car um and everyone just went weird. All the staff went weird. And people were all making these faces at each other that I couldn't interpret. Mm. And then the next thing I got hauled into the head nurse's office and she was like, uh, you're asking intrusive questions of the staff and you know not to do this. Um, because I'd also tried to make small talk with a teacher in class and I asked what school he taught at before he was in the unit. And this was all seen as like, Oh, really dodgy and trying to find out stuff about them. God. Wow. It's fucked. Honestly. Yeah. Like, wow. But I'm finding that confusing. So that must have been yeah. so confusing. I just for a remember yeah. mind. I remember at that point thinking, okay, I've not done anything to get in trouble. You're all treating me like I've done something really bad. And it was so embarrassing having all the staff have a go at you because my identity up till then had been, well, I'm just quiet and hard working and I don't get into trouble. And then after that, I was like, do you know what? Fuck the lot of you. I started like smoking outside in the breaks, mm. started mm. smoking weed when I went back to normal school. Um, because my parents had also treated me being put in the CAMS unit as this shameful thing and just never spoke about it. And my brothers never brought it up either, even because mm. I've got two younger brothers. So every day this taxi was coming to pick me up and take me into the unit and then I would get dropped off at the end of the day. And no one mentioned it. Whereas for me, obviously it was this massive change in my life that I'd yeah. been taken out of school and put in a mental unit. And then you would come home and you're just sitting eating dinner normally. <laughs> but I'm really close to my um, my brothers, um, especially my youngest brother. He said recently, he was like, we were terrified because mum and dad hadn't mentioned it at all. Mm. He said, all we knew was that you'd stopped going to school and just started getting picked up every day. Um 
And I mean, unfortunately, that's how a lot of Catholic families operate. I mean, not just Catholics, I guess. That's how a lot of families yeah. operate mm. is never mention uncomfortable things. And mm. it yeah. might just go away. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> When, yeah. When you um so being in like school obviously being so hard and friendships um in in a meltdown for example mm -hmm. if you're having a meltdown whether whether you're at school or as I an adult I would never have one at school. Ah. Oh. Cuz you keep it all in till you get home. Gotcha. Because the goal is present, present as normal, normal as possible at school, mm -hmm. keep your head down and then the pressure just builds up and builds up. I get you. So cuz I guess I'm I'm often thinking like if I witness, if I'm just in public and I see like a kid have a meltdown, an autistic kid have a meltdown, yeah. uh, or even if, like I might not know them, but even if I did know them or if I, if I happen to get to know someone and then I discover that they're autistic and they have a meltdown in my presence, I guess I'm just interested to know what's the best way, what, what should I do? Oh, um, don't shout at them because that will make it worse. Uh, try and get them to a quiet place. Try and get them mm -hmm. to somewhere where they can calm down mm. and regulate. Uh, there's grounding techniques you can do, like breathing or some people have um, stem toys. Someone from my audience brought me one the other week. A stem so toy? Cute. Oh, like a... Uh, stem, stem. Oh, like what like is I'm that fidget science? I'm yeah. fidgeting with this hair tie just mm. now. Ah, uh, gotcha. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's like a squeezy ball or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But um, actually, I had a... So I, I said I didn't have meltdowns at school. I had a meltdown in an airport in somewhere in Canada. I was going to the Montreal Festival. Mm. And I didn't think that would happen to me. But it was like a perfect storm of... Um, didn't have any sleep on the plane. Uh, I'd had some sort of sleeping tablet that like messed with me. Uh, and then I got stopped by border security over, mm. I'd filled out some COVID form wrong and it was like loads and loads of stuff. And I was like, oh, I'm, I just started like crying uncontrollably in, in front of this guy. Yeah. Um, and then I'm, it's almost like you have to become the parent to yourself. So I just took myself off into a toilet cubicle and I got a, a bottle of water and just stayed there to calm down. But if you know what's happening and what to do about it, it's so much better. Mm. But I really feel for parents of autistic kids because I've heard stories of someone's kid has a meltdown in public and then other parents are looking at them really judgmentally. Mm. And that happened a lot with me. Like my mum would always say, oh, you've always been a bad child. Uh, there was one time we were having a fight when I was 16 and she was like, ever since you were two and we were in Edinburgh airport and I'd had a meltdown because of the smell of perfume, the fluorescent lights, the mm. uncertainty, like everything. Um, but, I mean, I guess I can't blame my mum because she didn't know mm. that I was autistic then. Mm. But I have noticed some airports are getting better because people now can wear uh, those lanyards and some airports have um, quiet rooms that you can mm. go off. Really? Yeah, yeah. And I've been looking out for them at Aussie airports. Um, I didn't know that. This would be life changing for families in Australia. If you own an airport in Australia, mm. please, this is not a hard thing to fix. Yeah, and if you wear a sunflower lanyard, at least in the UK, you can go through the priority queue. But I haven't done. It. <laughs> I haven't done. I'm, <laughs> something I'm conscious of because I've got what they used to call Asperger's. I've got ASD level one. I don't want the people with like the next up level to think I'm taking the piss oh. and just trying to, uh, well, yeah, do you know what I mean? A whole nother I just, I just, yeah, like, yeah. I, I know that sometimes there's tensions where people are like, oh, there's all these people with what you used to call high functioning autism. There's a whole debate around why not to say that. Mm. And they're going on about their autism. And what about my kid who has so many mm -hmm. more needs? But the lady that did the, through an autistic academic did a sensitivity read for my book, this amazing woman called Joanne Limburg. She said she had someone say that to her and she was like, well, I have so much more in common with your autistic son who has additional support needs and we should think more of like the common ground that we have. And yeah. um, I do think it's important for people like me to talk about stuff that's affecting other autistic people. I mean, only last week there was another case of a black autistic person in America got killed by the police because they phoned 999 while he was having some sort of meltdown. 
and the mm. police killed him. Jeez. That's that's happened so many times mm. because being black and autistic is extra dangerous. Yeah. Because it's not what people think of when they think of autism and it's not what's been presented to us in the media. Um, do you remember that guy? This all came out during Black Lives Matter and I reference him in my book because it's so grim. That guy, people said it, it was a black guy who got killed by the police. So clearly presented as autistic to me. Um, and he used to play violins for rescue kittens. This all came out. Oh. After no, his death, heard this, no. well, the the police suffocated him. He was walking. Do you know why I think they did it? He was wearing his headphones and he was walking through the street and dancing and just having a nice time. Mm. And that was seen as odd behaviour. Um, and he was in a tussle with the police and he died. And during the tussle, he advocated for himself and he said, uh, "I'm just different." Um, and he oh. tried to like explain oh. it to them. Oh, God. So I wish more people knew about stuff like that when they try and say, oh, everyone's getting diagnosed these days. There's mm. there's all this stuff going on. Mm. Before, when you were um, talking about the CAMS unit, you mentioned that you had an overdose. Yeah. But you mentioned it in a very quick, flippant, not so much flippant, but a very quick way. Would you mind going a bit deeper into what yeah, happened? Yeah, I, I, do, I do tend to... And, I mean, I have friends that are like this as well, uh, talk about their suicide attempts in quite a flippant way. But I suppose it's because by the time you've had them, I don't know, the bit before it is so much worse. There's so many other things that feel so much worse. Mm. So, yeah, to, um, autistic people are uh, nine times more likely than the general population to attempt suicide. Yeah. Um, it's like a massively elevated risk. Um, so I've had it a few times, but I'd say when I took an overdose when I was a teenager, it was a lot more, I didn't want to die. I just wanted to not be in the situation I was in anymore, which mm. was having to go to a school that I didn't want to go to every day. And I was obsessed with getting straight A's and getting into like the perfect university. Just, I was very all or nothing about success. Um, and I was just tired of thinking about it all the time, the combination of thinking about that um, and then all the other teenage stuff. Plus, I was on a massively high dose of Prozac that I shouldn't have been on um, because I don't know if you know, like, Prozac does have a risk of um, suicide attempts. Oh, okay, and, I didn't know that. Uh, I think, as I said before, autistic people can react differently to medications. Mm. I mean, even, like, I barely drink. But if I have two glasses of wine, my eyes will be rolling about my head because I'm yeah, such right. a lightweight. So I was just on all this stuff that didn't suit my body. Um, and then after I took the overdose, things got better because I got put in the CAMS unit. And I didn't love being in the CAMS unit, but it meant I wasn't in school. Yeah. And as I said in the book, my parents could have put me in the garden shed with my textbooks and it would have had broadly the same mm. effect. Mm -hmm. Because it was such a relief to not just have to deal with all this sensory overwhelm every day. Mm -hmm. Did you, and sorry if I picked up on this the wrong way there, but did you say you'd attempted suicide a few times before? Um, there was one when I was little. Okay. Uh, really little. Um, because I, <laughs> cause I got a bad report at school and my parents were really angry mm. with me. So that's like a wild dis disproportionate reaction mm. that I used to feel silly about. And then I've since read about the circumstances around which other autistic people um, commit suicide. And it's very, like, similar Yeah. Okay. sometimes. It's not always the same reason, but all or nothing thinking and yeah. thinking things are the end of the world. Mm. Um, and then, yeah, I've done it three times, but not since being in comedy. I'd say things got so much better when I started comedy. Oh, wow. Comedy gave me so much more freedom and um, gave me a life where I was able to be myself without being punished for it. Whereas when I was at school and at uni, my life was really suffocating. Yeah, sounds it. The other thing that I'm interested in your thoughts on is people will sometimes say, I've heard a lot of people say, well, we're all on the spectrum a bit. We're all a bit on the spectrum. Yeah, are we though? We're not. <laughs> you're autistic or you're not. Mm. Yeah, that's 
that was something that was that someone saying that to me actually delayed my diagnosis. Mm. Um, said, "Oh, we're all on the spectrum, and do you really want uh to have that on your record and to have that label?" Mm -hmm. Um, so that then delayed me getting diagnosed for another two years. The way I understand people saying we're all on the spectrum is I've been told that neurotypical people have a tendency to speak in generalisations. Uh, neurotypical people see the big picture. Autistic people see detail first and think of the bigger picture later. Mm. That's a really handy way yeah, to yeah, think of it, is. actually. Mm. Um, so when people say we're all on the spectrum, I guess it's another way of them saying hey, don't feel alone. But mm. for autistic people, the way we hear it is it's minimising this whole secret world of struggling with sensory issues um, and trying to cover it up mm. and never really knowing what people mean when they say stuff and being in a constant state of cognitive dissonance because neurotypical people tend to not always mean what they say or say what they mean. Yeah. So. Sorry, I'm just peppering you with questions. Uh, no. Is that a... It's an interview. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's kind of the point. <laughs> oh, oh, no. <laughs> I remember hearing yeah, Apologies about the microphones. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> the, to be honest, the brothers thing threw me even more <laughs> yeah. because it was just such a quiet reveal and then you looked almost slightly mm. embarrassed that you were brothers or something. Oh, um, the weirdest part is I'm their dad. <laughs> what? Yeah, it's really strange. Yeah. I was thinking you're their cousin, actually. Yeah, no, just um, proud father. Oh, that's lovely. Proud father. Yep. I remember hearing a writer, I think it was Christopher Hitchens, talk about how where a lot of neurotypical people are unaware of how many cognitive dissonances they hold at every yeah. point uh, unknowingly. Um, it, and is... The th is cognitive dissonance a very unpleasant or difficult thing for you to hold on to? Like, is it, does that add anxiety to what you're feeling? So I was just reading the other day, someone autistic online was saying, we're not bad at reading social cues. It's more that the way neurotypical people talk, we know that they don't necessarily mean what they're saying. Mm. So, for example, one of the hardest things to get used to is people say, how are you? And you've not to say how you are. You have to say, fine, that's the <laughs> correct answer. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> so often I get this sense when I'm playing at small talk, because it does feel like a game that you have to get right. I get, <laughs> I do get the sense that I'm in like an absurd uh, theatre performance. <laughs> um, because every time someone uh, says to me, oh, Hope you had a great weekend. I want to say, well, I work every weekend, so I was just working. Uh, <laughs> like, and you can't do that because it's jarring for people. Mm. Um, so you, you have to work within this system of trying to rub along and remember the right answer to stuff. But when when I was younger, I was so, but I would say the maddest stuff all the time because mm. I didn't know. Yeah. Um, I didn't know I was autistic, so I would just number of comedians that have said to me when they first met me I just came out with this thing like I've got this lovely friend that I met when I was doing a competition called So You Think You're Funny that a lot of new comedians do um and he said that I said to him your weight really goes up and down a lot doesn't it and I was like you're like Kirsty Alley from Cheers <laughs> and he like had really struggled with Benji in and I just was coming out with this stuff yeah or just the number of times I've been, someone will tell me something I've said and I know, I don't disagree. I'm like, yeah, I did say that. Mm. But from my perspective, I meant something different. So my friend Lou, she hated me the first time I met her, the, this comedian Lou Sanders, because I was staring at her hands and I said, hey, you have big hands. And mm. she was like, um, okay, thanks. <laughs> but thanks. I was uh, I was excited because I'd started to notice loads of female comedians had big hands and I thought, <laughs> what's the connection here? <laughs> <laughs> but I suppose from their perspective, someone's just come up and like insulted a part of your body. Whereas mm. for me, my view of the world was just focusing on all these big hands. Yeah, the detail first. Big <laughs> well, that was like the 10th. Yeah. But a pair of large female comedian hands I'd seen. So I was like, maybe there should be a study on us. <laughs> like, mines are massive. I mean, just listening to you speak, I just feel like, and and with my experience, it just it feels like 
people with ASD, they're honest and yeah. they even even the like like the small talk thing, not being able to do small talk. Yeah. You just say what you're thinking and you respond to the situation around you. Whereas neurotypical people play we play a part, like we act like play characters. Yeah. Yeah, we play mm. characters. And yeah. and the small talk thing, I was vastly aware of that when I met you this morning. I didn't want to do small talk. Oh yeah, you were great. No, but I wasn't because I said, Oh, so how many times have you been to Australia? Do you like being in Australia? What's I your... do. Yeah, I, <laughs> I know, but I but I just feel like the neurodivergent way of doing things, it really makes more sense, a lot more sense. Well, we yeah, we have, I've seen other autistic people say um, to neurotypicals, honesty is like a magic trick because when I started in comedy, I was constantly getting called, oh, she's so honest, she's so fearless. And I was thinking, no, this isn't, it's not fearless. I'm, I'm such a scaredy cat. Um, so I found that very baffling. Um, because mm. I mean, for me, it's more of an effort to, to try and do things your guys way. Um, mm. and I do make a big effort in it. Um, I, the, the thing that popped into my head then is a, uh, yeah, there's a book written by the, uh, I think he's a neuroscientist, Sam Harris, that talks about, um. I love Sam Harris's, uh, meditation. It's great, isn't thing. it? Yeah. Such a good app. Some of yeah. my friends won't use it because they're like, oh, he's got problematic views. And I'm like. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but it's not like if you play the meditation tape backwards. You have backwards. to take on the view. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. it, it's my favourite guided meditation it's really by good. far. Yeah, I've done it a bit as well. I yeah. absolutely love it. Yeah. He has a book on lying uh, and he tries to take on a philosophy and he writes about uh, trying to never tell a lie as a person and he talks about the when you commit to not telling a lie, there's a weight that comes off your shoulders that you didn't realise how many lies you were telling in every day and every little lie. And he argues that every little lie has a cognitive weight on people that wow. allows this space to live a more, uh, uh, you've got more energy from other stuff in your life. And it just seems that the way you've spoken today is such a, it's like putting a magnifying glass on that idea. That's interesting because that makes sense with the relief that I feel when I do stand up. Like mm. I've heard some stand ups say, Oh, who I am on stage is a is a character. And I always find those ones a bit mm. I think, no, you're trying to ask, you're you're trying to not own that you have those views. <laughs> because for me, the way I am on stage is I'm most I'm the most myself on stage. That's mm. why I called my show I gave you milk to drink because there's a Corinthians quote. Uh, I gave you milk to drink because you weren't ready for solid food. So I was trying to say all my previous <laughs> shows have not been the most honest. Oh, and this show I'm going to try and be the most honest. Mm. Do you, when, when you, because I'm so interested in the moment where you were diagnosed mm. and were you already doing stand-up comedy? You already, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah, yeah. yeah. so, I've been doing stand-up since 2010. Oh, okay, yeah, gotcha. Yeah. Okay, so... Because we, so I've worked in, not never in stand up, but I've worked in comedy and done comedy yeah. things for for a while. And uh, I was really reluctant to start doing this podcast when we started it because I was really nervous about people, like about being vulnerable and talking about m myself and like serious things uh -huh. because I was worried that people would not see me as a funny person anymore and think that I was taking myself too seriously. So I was just wondering, and I think. I if, had that with the book. Oh, you did. I thought the book was going to be niche because I was the way I was thinking, I was like, no one I work with is going to read it. So I'm just going to say whatever. I'm going to put like the most fucked up stuff mm. in the book because like at that point I hadn't read one of my best mate's books. So I was like, well, he's not going to read my book. <laughs> so the, um, <laughs> comedians aren't interested enough in me to read my book. It's just going to be read maybe by some autistic people. And then... I remember like the week it came out, I actually had to start putting uh, locks on my Instagram and shutting myself out of Instagram because I got, no exaggeration, I've had like hundreds of messages mm -hmm. from people being like, it's freaking me out that your life is like my life. And even I, I was gigging in America last year and this woman came up and she was like, your life is my life. And then she went, but I did foot porn instead of stripping. <laughs> and I was like, okay. <laughs> and I really wish I could have that as a quote. <laughs> so I've, I've met people from all different backgrounds. Sorry, sorry. What was the first part of that quote? I did what? 
foot porn foot instead porn. of stripping. Oh wow. Yeah. She was uh yeah, and that was that was some women from uh from New York told me that. But I've I've had that experience repeated loads, people from all different backgrounds and men as well. I was worried that men would be put off by the title and not read it, but it's been the response has just totally surpassed anything I've done in comedy. But I thought it was going I was like, this is gonna end things for me. Mm-hmm. This book is gonna end my career as I know it. I'm interested in stripping. Uh, as in <laughs> Well <laughs> the three of you's managed not to ask me about it and I, I think that's admirable <laughs> until okay. now. Good okay. But I had a lot of fun talking about it in the book. Go well, no I trust you. No, well the reason I asked is because yeah. I feel like surely that's noise and lights. And I know it's your part-time job when you're at, at uni. When you're studying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So for like two and a half years, it's one of the longest jobs I kept actually. Is it? And I was so bad at it. Oh, <laughs> it's really telling that I've made more money from comedy than I did from a job that's supposedly easy to do, <laughs> or seen as this, you know, sex work. I think people who haven't done it see it as this last resort. Like if all else fails, I'm going to go into this, and it's like it's hard. You have to be really good at making men think you're interested in them. Mm. And if I I can't fake that, mm-hmm. I really can. I literally would have men throw money in my face and walk out. <laughs> wow. <laughs> because I would inadvertently say an offensive thing to them. <laughs> it's a good way to get the money off them. Yeah, but imagine being like, oh, I can't wait to go to the strip club. And then the stripper puts you off strip clubs completely <laughs> to the point that Put you storm you out. Place. It's a really, yeah. I mean, it's a fascinating, considering everything you've talked about with how you um, live in the world. It, Yeah, exactly that. It seems like a really, be a really interesting film character, an autistic stripper. Mm. Hey, funny you say that. So um, partly the way I got into writing the book was I was writing a script about, I mean, just... I don't know if you can picture the way Scottish strip clubs are. They're like, <laughs> like, imagine, have you seen the film Hustlers? I haven't seen it, no. Well, Jennifer Lopez plays a stripper yeah. in it. Mm-hmm. She's really hot. Yeah. Uh, imagine Hustlers if everyone was ugly. <laughs> 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 well, Excellent. <laughs> I, I was more thinking about the sensory overload, but that's that's a... Thank no, the lighting's great. The lighting's dark, so you can't oh. see how ugly everyone is. <laughs> <laughs> no, the lighting's oh. the lighting's like a dimmer switch turned down, so right. it's almost off. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, so then well, I started writing my book about autism, and I started reading how many um, sex workers also happen to be autistic or ADHD which is such a, I never would have thought that mm. would have come up. I read this blog by an autistic stripper and she lo- she said she loves it because the conversations are the same every night. Oh, yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. People yeah. say, you're too nice to work here. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you have a boyfriend? I don't really want to dance, thank you. <laughs> like, yeah. it's just the same things mm-hmm. every night. So then you can create a system similar to stand up of working out what is the perfect mm, thing to gosh. say. Mm. Um. So yeah, I'd really had fun writing about stripping in the book. I did one chapter that's like, here's all the fun times and one chapter like, here was all the bad times because it's not one thing or the other. Mm-hmm. Mm. I think, I mean, it's a very, it's it's a very interesting story in relation to autism, I think. I think that's sort of like yeah. the really sort of fascinating part about it. And I really worried I would get pushed back from people being like, oh, I've got an autistic daughter. Are you saying this is what they should get mm. into? The whole time I was writing the book, I had to push voices out of my head of people being like, are you saying all autistic people are like this? And then actually it's only been, so I think the book just came out here this year, but it's been out for a year in the UK and the paperback just came out and it was only when the paperback came out that I did have a couple of people messaging mm. being like, you're making autistic people sound like we make a series of bad decisions. And I was like, no, no, no. This is me. Mm -hmm. This is me with autism. Uh, Because the thing is, I'd read a ton of late diagnosed autistic women's books before. They were all great. But a lot of them, with the exception of Hannah Gadsby's, actually, were... They'd had very sheltered upbringings, um, which is great because it means they were cushioned from the worst of what can happen. And you have to understand 
the autistic people are very vulnerable. We're overrepresented amongst homeless pop- populations. We're overrepresented in psychiatric hospitals. So we can fall through the cracks. And I was only seeing one type of autism represented. Whereas for me, my teens and my twenties, it, w- it was just one chaotic event after another. Mm-hmm. And I mean, now it's like very smooth sailing by comparison. Yeah. So I just felt it was important to show that side of it. Oh, it's just been yeah. such an enlightening conversation. It is so, so wonderful to meet you. You too. And we wish you all the best for your tour. Um, and the, the book is wonderful. So the tour is pretty much all around Australia. Yeah. It is, um, I gave you milk to drink and we will have a link to the tickets in the show notes. It's so nice to meet you, Fanny. Yeah, you too. Yeah. You've been so much. lovely. So lovely. Oh, and the Netflix uh, the Netflix show Oh, as my well. Netflix show. Yes. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. If you have a look on um, Fern's Instagram page, you'll see a Netflix promotion <laughs> with her dad, which I just love I so much. I just thought it'd be funny to make a trailer of my dad reacting to good news the way he always does with total indifference. And then, <laughs> and then I've got the Netflix thing playing at the end. It's like, so good. <laughs> He basically finishes by saying, I won't watch it because I don't have Netflix. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Um, Thank you so much for joining us. It's been an absolute um, pleasure. Thanks very much. Thank you.